Well, obviously, my, my first tip to, to any serious PCB designer is to consider, you know, 3D printing earlier on in the, in the process. That's, uh, that's my responsibility. But also, we see that, you know, this ability to quickly check, you know, how quickly do you get to, to a proof of concept? How quickly can you get a design validation going? You know, how many people are waiting downstream for you to perhaps make that next uh, rev, that next iteration? And uh, having, a, having a printer to hand allows you to move from a mindset of, you know, of revs and iterations, perhaps to one of a more sort of continual process of, of, of innovation, which you can punctuate by printing as and when you like. So my recommendation for PCB designers is to try your best to get on to the latest release, um, because we've improved Allegro uh, significantly. 17.2 release, which was released in April 2016 is chock full of features. It had improvements in rigid flex, the ability to define flex layers, ability to do interlayer checks between different non-conductive and conductive layers with the flex and rigid flex coming together. We also brought in via structures that help PCB designers um, you know, ensure that they're using the right sets of vias Different, differential pair vias along with ground current return path vias. All of those can be instantiated initially right at the beginning rather than adding them afterwards after analysis. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other features in 17.2. Since then, we have done four quarterly releases. QR1, 2, and 3, and 4, and each one has improvements. Now, majority, 99% of the improvements are part of what you already own. So my recommendation for designers is to get on the latest release, understand the new capabilities that are there that help you be more productive. You know, why struggle with old ways of doing things when you can do it faster, easier, go home, have a nice time with the family, relax, have a nice sleep, instead of worrying about your schedules. My biggest tip for PCB designers is that you know most of the folks out there that are doing the work in the industry are very, very mature and great at what they do. I think we're at a point where we need to start investigating what the design process looks like and start optimizing the design process as a whole. Things are changing, technologies are changing, the methodologies are changing. So to be able to keep up with market demands, I think it's uh, kind of time for some of the uh, engineering teams to work together, start examining what their workflow looks like, and start looking at where they can optimize that. Don't trust your modeling. Uh, we find that, that PCB flatness uh, is variable just in sample to sample at room temperature before you do any heat uh, very significantly. So uh, certainly if you model how flat something is going to act over temperature, that's going to give you some representation of how it might behave based on the material properties and things like that. But in, in reality, when we actually test these and get them in-house, you know, your, your flatness uh, just off the line before you do any reflow uh, is going to vary pretty significantly and that's across, across the board into many different applications as well. So uh, that's one, I, I think a lot of the stuff that is more obvious to designers are things like copper balancing, uh, you know, considering different material choices. Uh, we've seen more issues lately with comparing your, your, your thickness of your component and your board as well as your materials and your components and your board, not just for warpage, but that they don't influence each other too heavily. If you put a big, beefy ceramic BGA on a, on a thin PCB, you might form a good joint, but then it might have a lot of power to pull and over time could cause issues after shipping or uh, ATC, thermal cycling, things like that. The first thing is know your tool. If you're new to the tool set, talk to someone else who has done a similar technology design on that tool or consult with their support service or invest in some training. Ensure that you're leveraging the tool to its utmost capability. Tools typically have a lot of functionality. Um, some tools are very GUI driven where you can get really deep into the menus before you find the function you want. Some like ours are more of a flat menu structure with a GUI portal that comes up and allows you to configure things. Play around with those options. Understand what the capability of the tool is because you may be leaving some enhanced functionality kind of on the table by not understanding how to access it or how to leverage it. 
So, you know, know your tool. If you don't know your tool, seek out resources to help you learn your tool. And then again, here's the redundancy. Understand what the manufacturing and assembly and test requirements are and how you can implement those into your DFM level checks or DFX level checks for the board to ensure that the product you're creating is as producible as possible. Because the worst thing that can happen is that you think your design is done, you're high five and your way out the door and you send it to the manufacturer and he sends back 64 different changes that you need to implement and you're back back on the board again. So, you know, that's the thing we want to try and avoid because that's a loop that causes, a, you know, causes a lot of schedule delays. It costs a lot of money. Um, and it's, that's the toughest way to learn a lesson. It's much easier to learn the information up front, implement it, and then validate it by sending it to the manufacturer. Actually, so when I talk to designers, and I talk to them pretty often, going through the data sheet and comparing data, sheet, data sheets is okay. But sometimes it gets a little confusing because when we put on our data sheet that our dielectric constant is three, that's tested per a certain test method. And if someone else that you're looking at is a different material, different uh, fabric or different manufacturer of materials, they may use a different test method. And when they get a three in their test method, it may not relate to our three. So there's a little strange things there. So one thing I would caution uh, the de designers about is when you look at data sheets, make sure you're looking at apples to apples. Uh, usually on the data sheets, it shows the test method. So you want to make sure that they're both using the same test method. Uh, that's one. Th that's one issue. Uh, another issue is really trying to look at the material properties in great detail for whatever the end use application is. And it's kind of common sense, but I mean, if you have an end use application where you're going to be cycling through a lot of different environments and the temperature is going to change a lot, then the, the item I talked about earlier, TCDK, that'd be pretty important to know. If you have an uh, application that's actually well controlled environment and you're not changing temperature, then well, TCDK is on the data sheet. Maybe you don't have to worry about that. Maybe you should look at something else. But uh, there's a lot of things that are not on the data sheet that can be important. One of them is copper surface roughness. So um, a lot of our materials, we offer different copper, and some of that smooth copper and rough copper. It's not mentioned on the data sheet. And uh, there's actually some reasons for that, because there's a lot of complexity about how you measure the roughness and what you report. But uh, anyway, that's another thing on the data sheet that if it's not there that really should be considered. So I think for the circuit fabricator or, or the designer, uh, I think the key thing I would say is try to compare data sheets when you're comparing different materials as close as you can, make sure they have the same test methods, same conditions. And then the other thing is realize there's some things not on the data sheet. And I'd say pick up the phone or email, talk to the manufacturer of the materials and try to get into more details. And even if it's something you know unusual like um, you know cry cryogenic application or something really different, we still have a fair amount of information and some unusual testing we've done that's not on the data sheet. So I'd say the designer, go through the data sheets, of course, figure that out, but really don't hesitate to give the manufacturer, the laminate supplier, uh, a call and really, you know, get in the details. Be open-minded and be willing to learn because a lot of the principles that make a board work right the first time and, and make you more efficient at designing it doesn't matter who you are, those principles apply across the board and they don't require a lot of, you know, difficult mathematics or study. I mean, if you want to model and simulate electromagnetic fields, go right ahead. But, but to get a, a high-speed digital design or mixed signal design to work right the first time from an electrical perspective, uh, there's a lot of good resources out there, like, for example, Rick Hartley's lessons on... Um, on RF and microwave and high speed and and uh, PCB layout techniques and and books like like uh, written by people like Eric Bogerton and um, and uh, guys like that that they actually make this approachable by anybody who's in the industry and make they really do demystify how things work how signals propagate on a board and how to avoid signal integrity problems so I'd say tip one be open-minded and be willing to keep learning I think a lot of people get into this because they like learning stuff anyway people become engineers because they like learning and so keep that alive keep that hunger and um, and dive deep into your tools make sure you use your software that every every ECAD tool out there is very mature but pretty much this is a mature industry I mean we started in 1985 
um, ORCAD started in 1984, I think, or five. I mean, we've been around, but what does that mean for a designer? There's, there's a lot you can do and a lot, of, a lot more power you can get out of the tools that you're using. So also, don't, don't just learn more about signal integrity and, and electronics principles. Learn more about the tools you're using because they can help you. They can make you much more productive and much more efficient and open up opportunities to do really much more interesting and complicated designs than you might have been doing in the past. So be, I'd, again, it comes down to being willing to keep learning, keep coming to PCB West and attend, you know, pay and come and attend the sessions because it's a lot of great wisdom in, uh, in some of the speakers who speak and share their knowledge and experience. And we need to hand this on to, you know, the next generation as well come to the shows like this, uh, like I'm, you know, at the sort of upper end of my design life cycle, uh, but I, I learn something new every time I come to these shows. I, I find them very informative. Uh, some people look at the bare costs, you know, of just attending, flying here, hotels, meals. You can't look at that. It's an investment, um, you know, in your long-term growth. And, and so if you can work for a company that allows you to come to these shows, by all means, go work for those kind of companies.